Bokatov, and Shalom. Um, I lost part of my voice uh, somewhere between Chicago, Washington, Germany, and Tel Aviv uh, last week, but I hope it's okay. Um, obviously, uh, I worked too long at Cisco before I joined DT, so I love buzzwords, and I came up with a new one, the software-defined operator. Now, what does that mean? Uh, let's have a little bit a look into our world the operators are dealing with. In the past, this was kind of an easy world. Customers were looking at parameters which were easy to control. Quality of service, latency, bandwidth, easy. But it's not only impacting the, the operators that you see actually a change in customer behavior. If you look at a completely different industry, look at the car industry, BMW, they even have the engine as part of their name, the motor is part of their name. Now BMW is advertising their one series as the car with the best connectivity. Because there's a change in customer behavior. When I look at my daughters who are 13 and 15, they wouldn't pick a car for the engine, as I still do. They would, book, uh, they would select a car based on the entertainment system and maybe the connectivity. So customers want sexy products. They also want more control, they want self-service options, they want f instant provisioning. Yes, they still want uh, the best price and they definitely want uh, to have a good service, so they want to have the best network. So some parts of our old world is still remaining, but uh, how do operators actually act in, in this world? Operators are known to be slow. So, typical market lead times for operators for mass market products are between one year, if you're really fast, two years, and maybe even longer. And, well, that's probably not sustainable if you want to partner with the internet companies, if you want to play a role in this world with, which is more than just providing a dump bit pipe, you better change. And that's what we are doing. Uh, so I invented this uh, term, the software-defined operator. For me, the software-defined operator is actually consisting of three parts. And all of them are equally important. Number one is you have to clean up. There's no way around that. If we don't simplify, we're going to lose the game. So we were starting the work on a new IP production architecture we call TerraStream. Um, back in 2011, uh, shortly before I joined DT. So, as part of that, the other two elements were actually also developed, but we are also executing a simplification even in the pre TerraStream networks uh, we are running in our operations today. So, clean up a simplified IP focused infrastructure. That's pro <clears throat> the, the first thing you have to address. Now, as part of the TerraStream development, we actually thought, how can we make the IP switching infrastructure better scalable? How can we use Moore's law and make advantage of Moore's law also in the IP uh, routing and switching infrastructure? So we came up with that concept, let's make the router simpler and let's uh, add a network IO optimized data center to the network and have that uh, basically fully automated. And by the time we started this, such a thing did not exist in the industry. So we wanted to follow the cloud model with a full lifecycle service management, with full automation. But it's kind of a part of the IP infrastructure, so we called it the infrastructure cloud. And that was a, a time back in 2011 where actually a couple of operators had similar ideas. and. Um, I was uh, presenting at Open Networking Summit in 2012 uh, in Santa Clara, <clears throat> and that was the starting point for discussions uh, with uh, other operators, uh, specifically Pradeep Sen, who is now at HP, but at that time he was at Verizon, and uh, Don Clark at that time at BT. Uh, and we all shared the same thoughts, and we felt the operators need to get together and express their wishes and uh, make a stronger point towards the vendors so that the vendors would finally support this new production model. And that was indeed the starting point of network function virtualization. So that goes back to 2012. And the next slide you're going to see is actually one of the slides which triggered this uh, 
<coughs> process of the operators coming together. That's element number two. But it's all worth nothing if we don't change the way we are operating our networks and we are controlling our networks. So that has to be in line with a new SDN-inspired uh, way of running <coughs> the network. So the traditional OSS is anything but very far away from being real-time. So we need to move to a real-time concept there as well to deliver on our customer requirements. We call that new system, which is SDN-inspired, the real-time network and service management, and that's the third element. So today I'm going to focus on the second part, that's the infrastructure cloud. And <clears throat> this was the slide which, which kind of triggered that uh, movement in the industry uh, towards NFV. And it's kind of the 100,000 feet flight level view. Uh, when you look at that uh, cloud picture, we envisioned at that time to build a network I.O. optimized data center. So what does that mean? So uh, in typical enterprise data centers, maybe the whole data center is connected to the outside world with a couple of 10 gig links. In our network I.O. optimized data center, we first <clears throat> built uh, back by the end of 2012 in the pilot in Croatia, each server was connected with uh, six, times, six times 10 gig uh, right to the core router. So uh, truly built for pumping data out to the network. And uh, within that infrastructure cloud, we wanted to run on one side services which are required to run the network. So that's kind of the extension of the IP switching fabric. Take a, a BRAS or uh, take uh, even the whole IPv4 production you could actually run here in the data center with a, a software technology. These are kind of the blue boxes on this slide. And when we came up with that concept, my colleagues who are responsible for core services said, hey, it's actually a nice idea. If we have a data center as a part of the network, we can also take the core services, whether it's a packet core for mobile, whether it's IMS systems, SBCs, or anything you want. Those are the magenta boxes and run them in this infrastructure cloud as well. And you can actually spin the thought further and talk to the content owners of this world and run kind of a virtualized or bare metal cache, depending on their requirements, in this infrastructure cloud environment as well. When we started building this, one thing was very clear. We did not want a dependency on a single vendor. And irrespective of which layer you're looking at, but definitely at the hypervisor layer, we wanted to build based on open software. The cloud orchestration level, we wanted to build based on open software. So we decided very early on for KVM as hypervisor and OpenStack as cloud orchestration framework. And uh, to, to add the storage level on top, uh, we are using Ceph in this area. So this is completely based on open source. Uh, on one side, we recognized, okay, the world is not uh, kind of ideal right now. A lot of elements still need to be added, and that, that's best driven in a community way. And on the other side, it was very important for us to avoid a single vendor dependency if you build such a critical infrastructure. Now, while we were implementing this, we, we felt, okay, this 100,000 feet uh, view is kind of uh, not sufficient to describe what we're actually doing. So this extension of the IP switching fabric, uh, we actually call that the front-end data center. So the, the front ends in, in our architecture, this is really where you have the heavy network I.O. And this is a fully automated area. Um, of the network as well. It's optimized for really maximum throughput. Uh, so as mentioned back by the end of 2012, we started with uh, six times 10 gig per server directly connected to the core routers. Uh, as soon as the 100 gig interfaces are uh, at a reasonable price available, uh, I would expect that we are switching to two times 100 gig per server because uh, the current Haswell processes are definitely powerful enough to actually pump this amount of data out to the network as well. It's an ip oriented data center, uh, so we are trying to avoid complex layer 2 or overlay technologies and really focus on IPv6 and kind of IPv4 is an exception, but we still tolerate it, but the majority of the <coughs> functions should actually use IPv6. 
So let's build at all core router sites. So for example, for a country like Germany, that's around 20 sites where you have these front-end data center for Europe. Um, around Germany, in our countries around Germany, it would be something like uh, another 35 uh, of these centers uh, you would build. These are not football field sized data centers. These are moderate sized data centers. So a couple of racks of servers which are added uh, to the core routers. The most important point is this needs to be fully automated. And you need to have an orchestration for that. These are distributed data centers. And uh, for example, high availability, it's achieved through geo-redundancy and the integration of the applications into the IP uh, routing system using any cast uh, mechanisms. Now, when you look at today's world, each vendor of a virtualized network function comes actually with their own orchestrator. And at a light reading event uh, last year in Chicago, uh, I had uh, created a term, the zoo of orchestrators. And this is what you end up with if you don't have actually a model towards a platform as a service, what you actually need as an operator, I believe. And this is still one of the big focus areas for us, actually, uh, how to avoid this zoo of orchestrators and come to a, a standard platform as a service delivery model. Now, we can talk endlessly about these things. And uh, what you saw happening in the industry was people typically uh, initially developed on PowerPoint and Word level or take your favorite uh, replacement applications and uh, then went into various proof of concepts. But I think we can only learn if we are taking things into production and not just uh, proof of concepts. So um, <clears throat> it was a li little bit more than a year ago I received the goal from uh, my boss. Uh, she wanted to demonstrate uh, that we are really producing this at Mobile World Congress this year. So we had the task to deliver one product to the markets, which is really produced in this uh, new way. <clears throat> so we picked a very old kind of thing, VPN. This sounds like absolutely non-fancy, uh, but it's still very important. And it's an area where customers actually want more flexibility. They want to react. They want self-control and self-provisioning capabilities. So we felt this is kind of an ideal first product to actually move to such a new cloud-based production model where we can show the advantages. And uh, here we were working in partnership with uh, Cisco actually to bring this to market in an incredibly short time frame of less than three months, uh, where the product was not developed before. So this was the, the first time this product was pushed out and the whole solution was indeed ready in three months and it's now offered in three of our countries, Slovakia, Hungary and Croatia. And we're gonna extend the footprint uh, over the next month as well. This was quite a challenge, to be honest, to, to bring this into production, because uh, <clears throat> uh, in such a short time frame, you really need to change the, the way you're working. If, if, if you look at your favorite operator, who, who in the room is from the operator community? At least one hand, two hands, oh, okay, very few. So operators are, are used to typical waterfall processes. You wait for one step to finish before the next step starts. And that doesn't fly if you want to move that fast. You need to move to a true DevOps model. And it's more or less a cultural change as well, which is happening at the operators here. So uh, this was definitely, uh, I would say, more complex than the technology challenge was the cultural challenge. So to summarize where we are uh, kind of differentiating is, we're, we're not just looking at virtualization. Virtualization is old stuff. We're looking at true cloudification of our network functions uh, in the infrastructure cloud. And we're not doing this uh, just to cut down our cost. We're doing this to actually improve the customer experience. So uh, we're also changing our production model. So also at Mobile World Congress, we have announced uh, the, the start of our pan-European network activities, where we are moving the whole production actually onto the OpenStack-based infrastructure cloud model for all the European countries we are active in. So this is 
a new area, a new era actually for the operators moving to such a new open concept here. And obviously there are lots of areas where we still have to work on. And I'm just including a few here uh, where I would actually like also to get more support uh, by the community. Everything we're doing here uh, will actually go back to the community. So orchestration, that's by far the most important one for me actually. And uh, just at, <coughs> around the Vancouver summit, uh, we had some discussions with uh, some other people around the telco working group as part of OpenStack, whether we could uh, take that forward also as part of uh, OpenStack. Now, I had mentioned the real-time network and service management, which was the element number three of our uh, software-defined operator strategy. And this is actually a Yang-based uh, <coughs> system. And uh, one thing is obvious, my orchestrator needs to talk to this Yang-based system, and I want to use Yang data models as far as possible also in managing my data center environment. The whole application lifecycle management is something we also need to work with our vendors who are delivering virtualized network functions, because they are not in this DevOps world today. They are still on a very traditional path, and kind of the automated testing, automatic deployment of new versions, it's not embedded in their brains yet. And we need to implant it somehow, and uh, that requires a lot of work. Uh, OpenStack high availability, it's still uh, one of the uh, problem areas uh, in our current uh, ice house uh, based deployment. Uh, so we will definitely move on here, but this still requires some work, I would say, overall and also the OpenStack lifecycle management, um, automatic installations, automatic updating, I think that requires still some work as well. Uh, yes, the various distributions have all found some ways around that, whether it's uh, Canonical, uh, whether it's uh, Red Hat or any other, uh, they have all found their ways, but it's kind of specific to the distribution. I would like to see a more common approach here as well to also the OpenStack. Uh, lifecycle management itself. With that, uh, Toda Raba and uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Axel. So um, you mentioned that that open source was was a key part of your your new strategy. Why is that, and what what's the kind of the history with carriers and operators and open source? Is is that is that common in the industry, or is that a, a, a newer take? No, when we started, it was definitely not common. Mm -hmm. So I personally have a long history with open source, going back since uh, to 1983, when I started to use uh, Emacs and the GNU C compiler at a very early stage. Um, so I know the value of open source. If you, you contribute back to the community, uh, First of all, you're avoiding that dependency on a single vendor, and second, it's a community effort, and you're much faster moving in a community if, once you have an active community. And you mentioned that the, some of the cultural changes were the hardest things that you've had to deal with. Does that, um, how have you approached that? How have you, how have you kind of uh, wedged the open source and the agile development and this new way of thinking into, into your environment? Well, uh, it's indeed uh, a difficult one, because you can't just uh, swap the whole staff. You need to take people with you uh, on that journey. Yes, you need some, some people kind of as, as the lighthouses uh, who, who kind of seed the whole uh, development, but uh, this, this whole cultural change, you need to, to pull in the people. And that, that's actually where I believe we have been really successful, uh, as uh, basically everyone recognized, hey, there's no other option. It's fascinating on one side from from a technology point of view, it's new for the operators, but there's no other way. So people were started focusing. Yeah. Uh, still, that creates some other challenges because uh, everyone wants to get involved. So all of a sudden, you have uh, hundreds of people who want to get involved, and you need to control that as well. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, cool. Well, I know later we're going to hear from TD Bank, and they're also going to talk about some cultural issues that, uh, that, that they have, have worked to address. So thank you very much, Axel. Thank you.